بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم respected listeners welcome to once again one of our amazing interviews with the author a conversation with a particular author you're joining us here on the Islamic Literary Society and we have been founded since 2019 and we have the aim of promoting fostering and developing a heightened appreciation of authors and literary works of classical contemporary scholarship um, this is accomplished by way of readings book launches talks by published authors and other speakers critical reviews and various other ways and one of the best ways and the most direct ways is to actually speak to the author um, himself so today we have a very interesting uh, discussion um, we have with us Dr. Mansoor Ali. Uh, let me give you some background on our speaker. Dr. Mansoor Ali studied classical Islamic studies and Arabic Dara Ulum, Bury, UK. Uh, also, he's an Al Azhar University graduate, so that's the two of us, alhamdulillah, Egypt. He then completed his postgraduate studies in Middle Eastern studies, Hadith studies, at the University of Manchester, researching a, uh, for a PhD dissertation the importance of the Isnad in a Tirmidhi's Sunan. Um, he is interested in hadith studies as well as applied Islamic theology and ethics. He has authored a number of books and academic journal articles on the subject of hadith, chaplaincy, drug addiction, and Islamic theology, and practical theology as well. So I'm assuming that is Ilmul Kalam. And he is a lecturer in Islamic studies at uh, the University of Cardiff. So without delaying any further, let us introduce our speaker. Uh, Dr. Mansoor Ali, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you, Doctor? Alhamdulillah, I'm good. I'm good. Okay, alhamdulillah. So, uh, Doctor, there's there's a lot of work that you've done, in particularly, um, I've got an article of yours in front of me about the perspectives on drug addiction in Islamic history and theology, and you've got various other works as well. So, we'll focus on that and other things as well. So, before we actually go straight into it, uh, could I get you to to give us an introduction about yourself, brief background you know, of yourself and the history of where you've been and what you said. I gave you a brief one, but you can say it from your words yeah. now. Okay, thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa kafa wa salamu ala ibadihi ladhina astafa amma ba'ad. Practical theology, first of all, is not ilm al kalam. It's more to do with kind of when sociology meets, um, you know, uh, theology and how oh. we kind of do uh, theology today. So this is, uh, this uh, um, article that you've got is an article on practical theology. There's another article of mine is called, Is the British Islamic, uh, Is the British rather anti-Islamic? Uh, that's basically looking at the 15 degrees, 18 degrees prayer timetable and how you know so it's it's basically a, a, a christian terminology of doing theology in the real world and okay. i just appropriated that um it, it, you do have to have some understanding so um yes so my name is mansur ali and currently i'm a lecturer in islamic studies uh, and arabic at cardiff university i'm originally from oldham originally originally from Bangladesh. Um, my studies started in Darul Ulum, uh, Birmingham, Coventry Road at the age of 11 in 1990. So I'm giving you away my age. Um, and I was there for five years. Um, and in Birmingham, Darul Ulum, we did the old Darsan Nizami. So we have a new Darsan Nizami now, and then we have an old Darsan Nizami. In the old Darsan Nizami, they had a lot of subjects uh, on Adab and also on Farsi. So we did a lot of uh, Gulista, Busta, Karima, Farsi stuff, which nobody does nowadays. And then, you know, we've did we've done Arabic literature books, Nafhatul Yaman, uh, Lamiyatul Mu'jiza, uh, Mufidul Talibin, uh, Rodatul Adab, these kind of books. Nobody, even in the Madaris, they don't even know about those. Um, studied Sarf and Naho in Farsi. Uh, uh, did I have a clue <laughs> what we were reading, but we had to memorize the entire text, Mizan Munchaib. So, but then later on, um, uh, after post 16, I went to Darul Ulum Bari because I felt that um, I wasn't getting enough uh, in Darul Ulum Birmingham. So, went to Darul Ulum Bari and uh, did another five more years in Darul Ulum Bari, graduated oh. first in my class um, in year 2000. Um, Alhamdulillah, um, and, and then came back to do um, Hivs uh, and was kind of, uh, in a way, 
forced to sit in the iftar class because they didn't have enough um, students in the iftar, so they didn't needed to make the numbers. Um, so um, I did sat in the iftar class, but didn't do any of the exams. Uh, so this is why I don't call myself a mufti. Um, didn't finish hives, by the way, unfortunately. Did 17 Jews in like, uh, I don't know, seven, six, seven months, yeah, but it, be, it became too much. And then um, I did a uh, stint in, in college, I left um, and then did a, did a year in college, did A-level psychology, sociology, criminology. Uh, always wanted to do the subjects because they always interested me. Um, got a place to do um, psychology at Manchester Metropolitan University. Um, uh, but then my Azhar kind of thing came through. So I went to Al-Azhar University with uh, three other friends from Darul Umbari. And because we had an exchange program with Darul Ulumbari, so we went straight into the third year of the degree um, ra rather than starting from Dirasa Khasa. You probably started all the way from Dirasa Khasa. Or... Yeah, I, <laughs> I had to go from scratch. Yeah, because uh, by the time I went to um, Al Azhar University, I've I've done all of the Kutub al Sitta, um, I've done all of the Ilmul Kalam, everything, you know. So what we call a Maulana, mm. uh, graduated as a Maulana. So uh, that kind of deep level was already there. It was just that the at the Arabic. Uh, speaking was a bit weak. Um, the faham was there. Um, uh, the understanding was there. So when I went to Egypt, um, you know, it took six months to kind of just brush up the uh, speaking skills and the understanding was already there. Um, a lot of people don't do this, but uh, we actually hired someone to teach us Amir. You probably stayed away far from Amir. Mm. Um, we found Amia, which is the local vernacular, um, to be a, a beautiful and a completely different language. So you have modern standard Arabic, you have classical Arabic, and then you have what we call the Amia or the local dialects. And we actually thought, since we're in Egypt and we have to converse with uh, people, we might as well learn this. So we got a Bawab Adoman, paid him to teach us kind of um, Amia. <laughs> um, yeah. So, and then we became very good friends. Yeah. Okay. So, so that must have been his dream come true. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and it's a completely different language. Uh, you know, uh, it's like, uh, you know, if, if I was to give you a Bangladesh example, Sileti and um, Shuddo, um, it's actually really two different languages, um, okay. you know, with different, don't, different grammars. Don't upset our Bengali audience, yeah. Yeah, no, no worries. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, so in al -Azhar University, I was there for uh, two years. Right. And uh, I was in uh, Kulia Usuluddin. Uh, which is uh, different from the kulia from the college that you were in. Um, so we did hadith, uh, hadith studies in the third year. Um, yeah. So and and then after coming back uh, after the fourth year, uh, so after two years, came back, did postgraduate studies at Manchester. First did my uh, masters in middle. So, 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 sorry, I just want to interject here. Um, so after you've done the traditional Islamic studies and yeah. you've come back. Now, what made you go into the, I'm going to call it the secular, but, you know, continuing on into masters and PhD, what do you think was the drive for that? Was there even a need? Was there any benefit in going down that route? Uh, well, um, yes, because I always wanted to um, uh, represent Islam in the uh, highest echelon of society, because uh, in, in the West, um, you know, not in the East because there's too many people doing that. And uh, also there are too many people doing grassroots uh, Islamic da'wah work, uh, but um, hardly anybody really talking to the intelligentsia, um, you know, and the higher echelons of society representing Islam there. And uh, in order to be able to do that, I, I needed to be able to talk their language and understand their kind of mindset and where a lot of these ideas are coming from. Um, that's one of the reasons why I went there. The other reason was um, Sheikh Maulana Dr. Mahmoud Chandia, uh, who's also a graduate of Darul Bari, he actually took that trajectory. You know, he went to Al Azhar University mm -hmm. and then he went to Manchester University and did his So I kind of followed his uh, trajectory. He's, mm -hmm. he's a lecturer in, um, I think, Preston University. So th th that was the thought process uh, behind that. Yeah. And, and now, having gone through that, and now you're a lecturer yourself, apart from the fact that you get to have a nice, comfortable job as a lecturer um, what, what, what do you think it was beneficial would you recommend others who there's many graduates from Dara Ulum and many other traditional Islamic uh, centers would you recommend them to go into academia and 
follow a route. Okay, match. so l let me get the financial incentive out of the way, and I don't I don't uh, shy away about talking about finances because we all need to eat. Um, okay, so uh, Sheikh Junaid, uh, you know and I know, right? That um, we love books and we're always answering answering fatwas and things like that. Um, and even if we were to be driving a taxi and there's nothing wrong with driving a taxi or working in a petrol pump, then at the end of the day we'll come home and we'll pick up a book and we'll read it and we may answer a fatwa or not. In my work, you know, I come to work at nine o'clock, right? Officially, and then finish at five o'clock. You know, these kind of works you never switch off of. Nine to five job. I sit down and I'm studying fatwas every single day. Mm -hmm. Either I'm studying fatwas, uh, researching fatwas, or, you know, I, I come in every single day and I read two, three pages of muafakat, mm. right? So, uh, and I'm, I'm getting paid a lot of money for that. Mm. I would have been doing that anyway. So this is my dream job to sit down and read, think, write, and get paid for that, which every single alim, ulama would have been doing, but they're not getting, uh, you know, paid for that. That's one thing. So that's the financial incentive. You know, I'm not going to pussy, I'm not going to pussyfoot around that. You know, that's, there's, there's a financial incentive doing something that you love doing and getting paid for that. Absolutely. That's no, number one. Number two is that if you really want to come up with um, blue sky thinking and uh, life changing trailblazing ideas, then you need the time to do that. And you also need the financing to do that. Right. If you don't have the time, you know, you come, you, you, do, you do your 95 job in the office, in the petrol pump or whatever, and then you come, you have to drop off the kids to the mosque, and then you have to spend some time with the children, and then you have to spend some time with the wife. And then if there is some time left, you'll probably be looking at your kitabs. That's not really the way, you know, uh, that real serious scholarship uh, uh, is made. Uh, you need the intellectual time to think, and also you need the finances. You know, finances, first of all, to kind of uh, uh, um, support you, but then also research requires finances. You need to buy books. You need to go and interview people. You need to go to conferences. You need to, you know, so all of this, and this is what uh, academia has given me, and alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah for that. Okay, mashallah. Um, <clears throat> okay, okay. So, I mean, as a whole, if if, uh, um, if one was to, in, to be engaged in da'wah, so of course I understand the benefits of academia, you get to speak to, the, to a different segment of the society, uh, but in terms of da'wah and just wanting to teach or wanting to spread Islam, do you think it, if somebody who's from Darulum would be more than qualified to do that, or would you think it's the Western masters or PhD would help him to think better, organize his thoughts better, present his arguments better? I mean, they're not mutually exclusive in the sense that it's not, uh, there is not, there isn't a, um, they com they're complementary in the sense that there are certain skills um, that you will get from Darulum, which you'll never get from, yeah. as, excuse me, as her or any other universities, but there are some certain kind of skill set that you will get from a university setting, you know, that you will not get from. Um, so I, I think, um, you know, for, for proper da'wah, um, they're also, you need to have first uh, deep knowledge, you need to have that knowledge, uh, da'awah without, you know, so there's different levels of da'awah, right, but da'awah with that deep knowledge, uh, you won't be able to answer everything, and uh, obviously even an alim won't be able to answer everything, but there's more mm. chances that the alim will understand where certain people are coming from, but mm. I think also uh, for the ulama, when in, in the Madaris, ulama, uh, when, when they graduate, they graduate at 20 years old. That's the age that people go to university. Uh, and in a way, they're still kind of not mature enough. I, I, I think the ulama learn on their own. They, they organically grow by kind of going into chaplaincy, going into life, you know, just experiencing life because life experience is another... The university education is not for everyone uh, because obviously you will be you will be studying with Orientalists, you will be studying with non-Muslims. You know they will uh, you will be studying things from a historical point of view, and um, you know they've got no dogmatic affiliation with your religion, and therefore uh, they may say things.
reacts to you, which is, uh, which may be um, innocuously, uh, they don't mean to offend you, but it might, it might offend you. So for example, um, why the Prophet وسلم, was so successful, we basically attribute that because he's a Nabi of Allah, he was assisted by angels and miracles. If you were to write that in the exam, you'll fail. Um, they'll want you to kind of explore more sociological reasons. Mm. Um, so, uh, and not everybody can palette that. Uh, yeah, not everybody, can... yeah, it's difficult for everyone to palette that. Mm. Okay, okay, that's very interesting. Um, also, uh, Doctor, notice, mashallah, you're very active and you write a lot. And you, as you mentioned, you love writing as well. So, a quick one for myself and others who are watching who would love to write as much as you do and write as successfully as you do as well. How do you start, or how do you come up uh, with the idea to write and, and and the subjects as well? Okay, so I mean. <laughs> I'm contracted to write, so I have to write. It's part of my job, right? But I think the idea comes when you when you are. So, for example, um, one of the things which is mess, uh, missing in my biography is for the past four years, I have actually been researching organ donation in Islam. Okay. For the past four years, and if you basically type my name on organ donation, you'll see huge amount of stuff. Uh, um, uh, I mean, for the past four years, I've been writing uh, on organ donation. You've actually chosen a very old article. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, um, uh, but I've, I've written more on organ donation than on actually drug addiction. I've only written one article on drug uh, drug addiction. Um, so basically. It, so if I was to tell you how organ donation I got in, involved uh, in that, uh, in the law was changing in Wales back in 2015, and so many people were asking me questions: Is it halal? Is it not halal? What happens if people watch pornography without? With, if I was to give uh, donate my eyes, what happens um, if I donate uh, my organ and then I'm, uh, would I be resurrected organless in front of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala? Would my ruh feel the pain? And I, and I didn't know the answer to that question, and so I, I thought, okay, this is pertinent it's timely and it's needed um you know i've got the finances in university and the time let me research this topic and um so simple as that i i wanted to know for myself and how i would be able to contribute mm. to the community and i've been researching the topic i mean just last thursday i spoke about it in east london mosque you know there was a massive conference so um yeah so sometimes it's it's a need in the community uh sometimes it's basically shock my own personal preferences so for example i'm kind of interested in the different ways that uh, people experience the Quran okay. okay so in different medium uh, and you know the, the very famous hadith uh, the very famous debate between the Mu'tazilas and Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal related to the nature of the Quran well uh, you know um, what is the nature of the Quran when it when it is in assisted media when it is uh, uh, you know do 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 we venerate the, uh, the Quran and revere the Quran in the same way if, if we're reading in the internet um, you know if you listen to a, a Quran over the mic uh, and a lot of this stuff came uh, because of COVID um, can we do Tarawih virtually you know, I've written about that. Um, can we do nikah uh, virtually? So uh, the, this all uh, comes from this idea of how do we conceptualize the Quran and how do you understand yeah. the Quran? And it's just an addendum to those old debates that was Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal was having with the Mu'tazilas. So sometimes it's just shock. Uh, sometimes it's expediency. It's a need. And but also um, I'm contracted to write. <laughs> <laughs> you, can't, you can't be an academic if you don't like reading or writing. Yes, that's not the job for you. <laughs> and uh, so roughly, how often do you write then? If it's part of your job and you enjoy it as well. So how often are you? So really uh, in academia, <laughs> um, basically, we have uh, four aspects to our job. Uh, can I talk about my work? Yeah. Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. So uh, as, as a lecturer who's a fully, uh, 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 fully contracted lecturer and not people who are kind of postdocs, fully contracted lecturer. Oh, um, there's mainly four aspects to a job. You're a lecturer, you're a researcher, you're an admin, and also you're an ambassador for your university. Right. What, you what you basically do is you need to teach, you need to lecture, uh, and there's quotas tariffs like the 40% of your time is teaching, you know, 20% doing that. So teaching and then research, 40% of my time is to do research. Research basically means getting grants, begging people for money, uh, researching, and then output publications. Okay. Because I think every year you need to you need to write about four journal articles uh, and mm -hmm. four journal articles every year is actually quite difficult to write with all the other things. Mm. Then there is um, the, the the admin side, 
right? Um, so for example, in my school, I am the um, director of postgraduate studies. So I look after all the master's program. Um, and that basically takes, uh, uh, so my school is history, archaeology, religion, you know, there's four departments. Um, so I'm basically looking at the master's program for all of them. And it, it's a lot of headache because you're dealing with staff, you're dealing with the modules, you're dealing with students. It's a, it's a lot of work. And that actually takes a lot of my time. Okay, mm. and then there's what we call impact, where your work you have to kind of transfer it into the community. So we don't we we've gone past the days of ivory tower academics, where we're just doing academia for the sake of it. We need to create impact. So those those are the four aspects of the of the job. The research is always the one because of all the admin and the teaching. That's the one that gets sacrificed quite a lot, and yet we need to do that. So when do we do that? I always get this question from people: Oh, it's Easter now, so you're off or on the summer holiday. You're off? No, we don't. We don't get off. Uh, we have to take mm. annual leave because it's Easter holidays, Christmas holidays, summer holidays, that's when we're doing our research. Yeah, subhanAllah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, subhanAllah. Um, so, so you said you mentioned a number of different articles that you've written, but we, we are going to just ask a few questions that's right. on your article, which is perspectives on drug addiction in Islamic history and theology. So the first question is, what is the link between um, drug addiction? and the impact that it can have on one's faith? Well, I mean, uh, 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 theologically speaking, um, you know, you we will basically know, especially in Tasawwuf, when you, you know, in Tasawwuf, we have the concept of fana fillah, annihilation, you know, in, uh, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And th that basically means that you need to uh, longing. So this is almost kind of Buddhist in, in, in ideas, uh, oh, the longness and longing, you have to basically absolve yourself of longing, you know, from the dunya, right? And addiction is not only, uh, so this idea concept of zuhd, zuhd with dunya, right? And the hadith, izhad fi ma inda nas yuhibbukan nas, izhad fi la yuhibbukallah, the hadith the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, you know, so, uh, so this idea of zuhd or ascetism, where we basically try to disassociate ourselves uh, um, uh, from the dunya. Uh, addiction, what it basically does, and, and the dissociation is because so that we can uh, focus our thoughts and ideas on, you know, spiritual development and on Allah and Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Uh, addiction goes one step forward and basically not is it longing for the dunya, but we basically immersed so much in the dunya that we're trapped within the dunya and we are not able to kind of come out um, mm. and do mundane uh, worldly things, let alone even think about Allah. So in a way, addiction is like fracturing our self from um, our origins. You know, uh, uh, as Rumi basically says, you know, Bishnu as chu hikayat mi, Bishnu as nai chu hikayat mi kunad, as judahi ashikana mi kunad. So this is listen to the reed, uh, the flute which cries of its origin, which is the reed. So uh, our our origin, ya ayyatan nafsul mutma'inna irji'i ila rabbiki radiyatan mardi. Our origin is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The dunya takes us away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but addiction not only takes us away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and fractures us from our origin but it traps us within a vicious cycle that we can't even escape so that's that's the kind of uh, link mm, like a type of self-destruction mode yeah right all right um so moving on then on the topic of drugs well we can even expand it a bit further uh so sheikh we know allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the quran this is one example that allah tells us clearly that khamar is is an intoxicant and it's haram and we're forbidden from consuming that but then when we look at drugs, drugs are evolving every day. We get all kinds of new drugs coming every other day. So, you know, if somebody approaches you and says to you, look, there's this new drug, it's called ice. I just made that, by the way. I don't know if there's a drug called ice. <laughs> but there's a drug called ice. Yeah. So the Quran spice. doesn't... Sorry? Spice. Is, is the drug. one called spice? Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> that was a complete guess. All right. So I'm assuming the origins of this one is India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, spice. <laughs> but... Um, yeah, so modern drugs, to what extent can we use Qiyas analogy to say that they're haram? Yeah, I think, I think uh, all of the scholars, they use analogy with Khamr, destructive uh, effects uh, of, um, uh, you know, the, the destructive effects of drugs or that particular drug um, on one's 
uh, first of all, health and well-being, and then on their financial well-being, and then also on their family, and then a society at large. Um, you know, so by looking at all of these things, uh, what they basically do is they say, well, you know, this has, you know, إنما يريد الشيطان أن يوقع بينكم العذاب والبغضاء في الخمر والميسر ويصدكم عن ذكر الله وعن الصلاة فهل أنتم تنتهون؟ Yeah. So, or is it Muntahun? I think it's Muntahun. I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. So you can the destructive effects of alcohol can easily be seen in these things, and 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 they are because you won't get a uh, uh, ayat uh, of the Quran which says Ya ladina amanu hurrima alaykum cocaine. You won't find that. So mm -hmm. they have to be involved in a process of uh, qiyas. Um, however, saying that. When certain drugs first came into the Muslim world, for example, cannabis, when it first came into the Muslim world, cannabis is called Al-Qinnab Al-Hindi or Indian cannabis, right. Uh, right? When it first came into the Muslim world, it was actually used for medicinal purposes and not for recreation. And therefore the ulama actually tolerated it. So for example, it, will, it used to help people who used to take uh, cannabis, used to help them to sleep uh, because it was so hot, it used to uh, help them to sleep. And uh, Ibn Sina writes about the uh, benefits of cannabis. Some ulama right from the beginning, you know, who were, who were very farsighted, they saw uh, the problem with this. And uh, for example, Imam al-Tahawi, and they said, look, this is exactly the same as alcohol and therefore it's haram, it's khamr. But okay. others basically, it took them, so there is a, uh, there's a scholar, Shafi scholar by the name of Safi al-Muzajjad, uh, uh, he tries um, some uh, uh, some of these drugs, right? And um, he he's doing eth auto ethnography, right? And so what he basically does is, nah, there's no effect on me, halal. <laughs> yeah, that's what that's literally what he did. He said, "There's no effect. Yeah, it didn't affect me, so then it must be." He gave a fatwa because they, they haven't got a basis. Whereas Imam Tahawi straight away said, "Well, no, this is qiyas." Others didn't do the qiyas because they didn't see it as harmful because it was used. It was it came through medicinal purposes. But then, as ulama started to uh, notice its um, you know it, 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 its harm on society. So, for example, Sheikh Al Islam Ibn Taymiyyah. Uh, so. Uh, um, uh, Qarafi, Imam al Qarafi, a Maliki scholar, seventh century Maliki scholar, he basically um, does some ethnographic work with drug abusers, you know, in, in you know, the under uh, the Muqattam mountains. And he basically says, well, actually, there is a, 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 yeah, some kind of um, intoxication, but it's not enough to make it haram. <laughs> he says mm -hmm. that. But then Ibn Taymiyyah and others, um, they they look at it more from the societal kind of uh, problems that it causes, um, and so Imam Ibn Taymiyyah says that the uh, the qinnab al Hindi or the cannabis is a, is is a punishment from Allah. So he basically says that the Mongol invasion of the Muslim world is a punishment uh, from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala because of uh, of Muslim weakness. Um, in you know in the uh, in their faith you know as the Lamaic Paul says was a man to muazzas the Muslim hawker abhar bani huwa tarik kura hawker because of Muslim weakness Allah basically uh, uh, um, you know subjugated them through the Mongols and one of one of the um, bad habits that the Mongols came with is cannabis and he says cannabis has two 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 effects mm. um, cannabis makes somebody at the youth a cockled right and makes somebody a muhannath and effeminate so basically the use is somebody who doesn't mind his wife going and chilling with other men and muhannath is somebody who becomes quite effeminate and it goes the effects of cannabis uh is somebody becomes the use and somebody becomes effeminate so basically somebody's really high and you know like mm. mellow feeling really mellow um but it's only when the ulama afterwards started seeing that there's widespread societal problems so for example in the 17th century imam abdul ghani and nab Lucy was able to give a fatwa that um, if a husband did not provide his wife with tobacco, then that is legitimate case for divorce because tobacco made her think better. Um, but it's only later on when we find out the harmful effects of tobacco that the ulama, they basically said, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. So originally when these things come about, ulama don't know how to categorize them. And then, yeah. you know, when they start seeing the effects, then they basically start doing qiyas on the Quran. It's well, uh, uh, a long uh, answer to your question. Sorry. No, no, it's, it's good and very interesting. I want to ask another question. 
that comes up, which uh, I'm really, really interested to know, actually. So clear-cut drugs as that one, you know, we can use qiyas and so on and so forth and come to an answer. What about things that are like performance enhancing drugs? So it's not really a drug that intoxicates, but it's a performance enhancing drugs. Um, are they in the same category or do they have a category of their own? Well, I mean, this is not a fatwa session, right? So <laughs> um, the thing is that um, I can't give you a blanket fatwa because we need to basically find out what the harmful effects are. Some performance uh, enhancing drug uh, basically might make you sterile. <laughs> Do you understand? Mm. So, um, you know, you need to ask one's wife whether this would be permissible or not. Mm -hmm. So I think I think we need to judge all uh, every single drug on their you know, own. Um, yeah. Mm, mm. But I mean, I know it's not a photo session, but I'm just interested. So if, if we found a performance enhancer drug that doesn't have that kind of effect, but it does make someone run faster, lift heavier weight, and so on and so forth, um, in general, then there's no real illa there for. The yeah, I mean, this is this is what happens with coffee, right? When when coffee was first brought into the Muslim world, mm. the Naqshbandiya uh, uh, Sufis, what they would do uh, is they will actually sit around coffee. Uh, and they will kind of read 50 times Surah Yasin on you, bless it, and then eat whole loads of coffee beans, right? Um, and uh, imagine having like a whole handful of coffee beans and eating that, the, the amount of kind of caffeine you've got in your body. And they basically saw this as blessed because it made them uh, more alert and more wakeful, and therefore they're able to do their zikr more. So, um, mm. yeah, I mean, there's precedent for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now I, I forget the names as such, but uh, from the Salaf, we find examples of people uh, burning certain plants or certain things that the smell. Habbatul, kept... habbatul Faham and Baladur and, you know, not yeah, so They were able to yeah. read more and write more. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, so moving on then with the same topic of drugs then. Um, so, can there really be an Islamic approach to drug rehabilitation programs? Um, so, in my article, I basically go through kind of three different systems of uh, drug re rehabilitation. The last one is uh, is basically called Millet Islami, which is a 12 step, uh, you know, the 12 alcoholic uh, uh, anonymous. Mm. Uh, so, the Millet Islami 12 step uh, rehabilitation is 100% modeled on the AA uh, and the Narc narcotic anonymous and the alcoholic an uh, anonymous. And what they've basically done is they've taken that language and then added god uh, into it um i think to a uh, um certain clientele to a certain per a person um bringing religion into it uh will help okay because it doesn't matter if you're if you're a drug addict um still there is a bit of religiosity in there so uh, religion might help for two others um it won't um so do we really have, um, so your question is, is there really an Islamic worldview or, 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 of, of drug rehabilitation or are we compounding, um, you know, just Islam and Islamization of uh, certain models? I, I, I think the answer lies somewhere in the middle. Um, mm. Because there are certain people who will respond uh, to, you know, um, Islamic notions, you know, through dhikr and things like that. And mm. other people, religion becomes really toxic. So there is this concept called toxic religiosity, where okay. religion actually uh, um, makes people depressed. You know, so right. for example, um, in my book, Understanding Muslim Chaplaincy, I write about this, that a, 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 a lady came to a chaplain. So this is not it's one of my uh, um, uh, people that I interviewed in the States. A lady comes to a chaplain and she asks a question that, um, is it permissible? Uh, no, it, uh, it, can a person remain, uh, can a person remain a Muslim if they love Allah and Rasul with all their heart, but hate the Quran with every single so, uh, cell and iota in their body. Right. Can a person be a good Muslim who loves Allah and Rasul but hates the Quran? And um, so the chaplain was strained and he thought, no, this question does not sound right. There must be something more. And he explored with her and then she kind of, uh, uh, you know, came out and she said, well, as a child um, in the mosque, she was abused by her mosque teacher and every single time sexually abused and every single time she tries to read the Quran, she relives that incident because it reminds her. And as a result of this, there is an inner turmoil, an inner fight within herself where she's basically... Uh, 
you know, there's a fight. She wants to read the Quran and she knows to be a good Muslim, you need to read the Quran, but then mm. she can't do it. And hence she's asking that question that can I not read the Quran and can I hate the Quran uh, and yet be a good Muslim? Um, but in a way, it wasn't a fatwa, it was a call for help. Like, sure. Please help me because I'm 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 struggling. And, and mm. then uh, they yeah. had a program. That's a good reminder as well for those working in the Islamic field not to take things at face value to always look at things a little bit never deep. uh it's it's mm. never i mean especially when first of all when people come and say sheikh i have a friend yeah right normally always they're talking about themselves mm. right and um uh, you know there is a question there is a question on who has power the, you know you know like a, a mufti and a mustafti uh, the, uh, somebody asking a mufti and the mufti there is a power dynamic here right who has the power here mm. right and I basically um, see that it's actually the mustafti, the person who's asking the question has, has got a lot of power mm -hmm. because the mufti can only answer based on the data that is being provided. And sometimes people who are clever and they want a particular answer, they will frame sure. their question in such a way that it's a checkmate for the mufti and there can only be one uh, um, answer and I think uh, I've been you know in 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 Islamic da'wah um, you know and, and Islamic studies from 1990 to now is to, uh, to over 30 years to have got enough experience to kind of um, catch that out and understand uh, the psychology of the mustafti what they're trying to do right right yeah. okay okay that's very interesting <laughs> so my last question with regards to your particular article on this a bit more of a practical kind of question um, what can Muslim parents or the community or the masajid, what can they do uh, to bring about drug awareness or to keep their children safe? Okay, so I think uh, there is not, there isn't a one fair um, uh, answer. One of the things that I've learned uh, in my uh, uh, work at the university and working with kind of Islam and bioethics, this is what I do, Islam and bioethics, is that um, you can't give a, a blanket fatwa or a blanket a, a answer. You have to basically say, well, for who is this answer for? Who is the clientele? Yeah, uh, because depending on who the clientele is, if if it's a patient you're responding to, then there's going to be one particular answer. If it's a, a practitioner you're responding to, then there's going to be another answer. If it's a policymaker, then there's going to be a different type of answer. Uh, same question, but it will be tailored to their needs. So similarly here, uh, mosque imams, mm. parents, right? There has to be different. So for example, uh, ch people who have small children, right? A parent should have open discussions about drug addiction, drug abuse, to understand the signs of how peer pressure, there's plenty of very, very good YouTube, uh, you know, videos out there, sit down and, uh, and see this. So for example, with my children, right. uh, I have two girls who are basically now 13 and 12. Um, without any embarrassment or shame, I've actually sat down and watched um, sexual exploitation and abuse videos with them and also um, child exploitation on the internet um, because very easily they can get, uh, uh, you know, exploited innocuously without even realizing. Uh, and very, very, from a, show, from a very small age, from the age of five years old, I've basically been teaching them, um, not me, not my wife, uh, been teaching them how uh, to react if somebody tries to touch them inappropriately mm. and they're trained. OK, so I think so parents uh, who have small children should start these conversations uh, without feeling uh, that, you know, how can we right. uh, the, the, the 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 mosques, uh, uh, first of all, um, the imam should uh, uh, talk a lot about these in um, in their khutbas, but also the mosque should a kind of um, uh, providing that the resources there is kind of go hand in hand with the rehabilitation and I'd ask them what can we do know the kind of um, uh, resources available so right. even pointing towards resources um, you know uh, so so the, the different ways that we can help the Muslim community okay okay alhamdulillah all right uh, so doctor we coming to the latter part of the of the conversation now um i'd like to get some advice from you uh advice for the muslim youth in regards to education reading and writing so how would you encourage 
uh, Muslim households to improve improve their literary activities? Okay. Uh, uh, point number one uh, will be to reduce. So that's that's the if you want to increase literary activities in your house, reduce the amount of screen time you give to your children. Mm. Without reducing the screen time, I've seen it in my in my own family with my kids. Without reducing screen time, right, you can't get your children to read, right? Yeah, because uh, they're too much into their TikToks and their Instagram. Their brain gets programmed to be able to uh, watch thirty seconds clips, whereas reading is, you know, it's hard, right? That's number one. Number two is, um, again, related to screen time. Okay. Get physical books rather than uh, reading. Because nowadays with Facebook and Instagram and all of these things, we can't read between two, uh, 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 beyond two, three paragraphs. Right. Okay. So reading has to be physically, you know, touching, you smell the book physically. Number three is that books don't need to be Islamic. Okay. Read whatever, whatever you want. Okay, I read The Hobbit when I was nine years old. Mm. Um, so read, you know, like, uh, so for example, I'm reading Fantastic Mr. Fox uh, by Roald Dahl with my son, he's nine years old. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be, uh, um, you know, um, Islamic books. But I, I, I think um, it, it, after every two weeks, a trip to the um, library will do good. Uh, restrict the amount of screen time and TV so that ch children need to feel bored. Okay, uh, children need to feel bored. And when they feel bored, then what happens is the imagination kicks in. Right. Okay. Okay. So I, I think these are things that we can do. Uh, the other thing uh, is that you cannot be a good writer if you're not a good reader. Mm. It's lazim malzum. You cannot be a good writer. And take that from me, right? As a professional writer, you cannot be a good writer if you're not a good reader. Mm. The other thing that I do, and this is, I, I learned this from Stephen King's. You know Stephen King's? Sure. Yeah, the very famous uh, yeah. horror writer. Mm. Um, I always have a book in my car, and oh, I always carry a book with me. And whenever I get time, three minutes, four minutes, so if I've go, gone to somebody's house, and my guests now, they don't feel offended that I brought, uh, I brought a book with me. They all know me. Um, and they've gone. They've gone to make tea or I'll come back in five minutes, right? Rather than playing on my phone, I'll open my book. And this is Stephen King's basically says, this is how you bump up your hours uh, and your time. You know, th those times which, you know, either mm -hmm. you can do dhikr or you can watch something on your phone. I read books. So always carry a small book with you. And I've seen Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad also do that as well. I worked with Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad. We've been to conferences together. I've seen whenever sometimes he feels bored, he'll get a book out. Uh, once I saw him getting a French book out and re reading it in a conference. So always carry a book with you. Okay. Okay. Mashallah. Um, so, uh, and Doctor, what's your opinion on um, setting up reading clubs? So gathering people together and reading things collectively and discussing. What's your thoughts on that? I think reading uh, reading clubs are uh, very good um, in motivating people, but in a way, um, you, you're preaching to the choir in that sense. Uh, mm. Only the people who who like reading will basically reading clubs are supposed to be something which is uh, quite fun uh, and things uh, things like that, um, uh, r rather than being a onerous task. Um, it's good, but I think reading club. Uh, works more for people who like reading rather than getting people involved in. Uh, yeah. that's the Doctor, how would you make a reading club attractive and what would, what would be your fam format if you were to run one? What would you do? Do you know what? I, I don't know. I don't run a reading club, but um, mm -hmm. uh, fun is something I'm really, really boring. Fun is, you know, my my idea of fun is having taught Sharhul Aqaid three hours on a trot. Um, I wind it down by reading um, Nietzsche. <laughs> That's my idea of fun. Um, so uh, I, I don't know. I think I think what ILS is doing, uh, I think is brilliant. Um, you know, uh, I, I, I think more. Uh, you know, I think this is the way forward. Interviewing authors, interviewing spe uh, speakers, writers. You know, it, you know, getting their uh, uh, thoughts. Um, some of their biographies. I think. And and do you know what? Let, let me tell you something. 
Um, books are wonderful. Um, you know, books. I I, I watched um, all of Dan Brown's uh, uh, movies. You know, Tom Hanks. Um, Angels and Demons and uh, the Da Vinci Code, and I've read all of the books as well. And I will, I, I will, I will say that the books hundred times better because your imagination uh, is basically the sky, and and you can you can pontificate and think so much. Which in right. in the mo movie there is only one point of view, and this is the director's point of view. Okay, whereas you 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 immerse yourself. You immerse yourself into the story and you become one with the story. Right. So, uh, yeah. Okay, mashallah. So I'm reading, uh, if you want to know, I'm reading Muhammad Asad's Road to Mecca at the moment. It's absolutely brilliant. Mashallah. Okay, I've got that thing right in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> I've had it for 10 years, never opened it on the side. Okay, now I need to read it because everybody talks about it. It mm. is absolutely brilliant. Absolutely yeah. brilliant. Okay, mashallah. Uh, so, Dr. Um, what are we expecting from you in the future? What's the what's the next few years going to look like? Any more publications? What's so um, at the moment, I am supposed to be writing my book on Islam and organ donation, supposed to meaning that I haven't started yet because mm -hmm. I am doing three book reviews and basically I have seven PhD students, <laughs> you know, and uh, so uh, I'm supposed to. So probably in about two years time, uh, you will see plenty of articles coming out. Um, uh, probably in uh, two years time, you'll see my publication on uh, organ donation. I'm also translating the Nuzhat al nadar of Imam oh, Ibn okay. Hajar Asqalani into okay. English. Um, so I don't know when that's going to, I do that casually whenever I have time. Mm. Uh, uh, it's not only a translation, but a sharh as well. Uh, so whenever, Allahu Alam. MashaAllah, that's, that's, uh, that's and I've also translated the Usul al Shashi, uh, that's published. Okay, mashallah. That's, that's a, you got a lot on your on your plate. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and, and I see you've also on, on your on your page. You're actually welcoming more PhD students. So you've got seven at the moment. You might end up getting a few more. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've actually got two more starting. Yes, yeah. So with those two more, it's seven. Yeah. Mashallah, tabarakallah. Allah bless you, uh, Sheikh. So uh, as we're here reaching the end now, any closing remarks, anything that you would like to address the Muslim audience and those watching us. Uh, those thinking of taking your line uh, of, of career or work, or anything you'd like to say to, to the Muslim audience? I mean, I, I would like to say um, to the Muslim audience that um, books is escapism. You go into the land of the books, whatever you read, fairy tales, Hans Christian Andersen, Harry Potter, you immerse yourself. It's a way of escaping from your reality. Okay. Uh, I love my Sundays. You know, Sunday morning, I, I just sheer pleasure of reading. I sometimes go to Costa Coffee and I I basically just sit down for hours and hours and I will just read. Um, and the reading is my passion. And I think that um, as a community, we will not, th there is tombs and tombs and wisdom and knowledge um, out there. As a community, we will only be enriched only be enriched um you know nothing will nothing will be taken away from us if we read we will only be enriched and that kind of enrichment of enrichment of the soul you know your soul gets it's, it's like listening to a live music you know orchestra where you know you feel when you're listening listening to something like uh, uh beethoven or something and you can feel your spirit uplifting i get the same kind of emotions when i'm reading a book you know mm -hmm. I, I feel like like at the, at the moment i'm reading muhammad asad uh, there's one two pages in Muhammad Asad's uh, book where he's describing just the waves, you know, just how, you know, he's describing the waves, just how the colors of the waves in two pages. And I basically felt that I was a part, part of the sea, just reading that. So, this is this is basically called al inghimas fil kitab, right? This is immersion. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, we can only enrich ourselves, uh, you know, there's no poverty in reading. Excellent, excellent. So stay with us. Um, uh, respected uh, listeners, I would just like to share with you. Uh, there we go. So I'd like to share with you our website, uh, the Islamic Literature Society. You have the uh, Dr. Mahmoud Ali there, mashallah. This is the uh, conversation. You call me Mahmoud Ali, Mansur Ali. Mansur Ali, sorry, uh, forgive me there. Mansur Ali, you got two M's there, so I got a bit confused. So Mansur Ali. Um, so this was the interview there. You can see all our information on our website. 
uh, if you continue down the tabs, you will see the book reviews. And along the book reviews, you've got Islamic uh, sciences, history, politics. So let's just have a look. For example, uh, let's click on book reviews and see what comes up. Um, so there we go. Look at these books, mashallah. So some real hench so books, I would use that, that word. That was actually reviewed by me, the Abu Hanifa one. Oh, is that you? Oh, mashallah, okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there you go. There's your name, yeah, doctor. Yeah, there you go. Mashallah. So um, real academics, you know, uh, doctors, uh, pro professors, and various others reviewing books. And you can see them here. So, you know, before you get your hands on these books, look at all these amazing books. And you've got reviews there. Um, and I strongly recommend you go and have a quick read. You know, if you're thinking about buying this book or studying this book, have a quick read and see what you think. I'm sure all, all the books are worth it. If you continue going down, you come across the tab titled videos. That's where you'll see these interviews with the author. So um, you see the name of the person, but who is he really? What does he look like? What does he speak like? These are, you know, when you come to the videos, that's where you get to see the person for real. News and events, uh, finding a reading club. Alhamdulillah, the, the Islamic Literature Society has organized uh, a reading club as well, and it's online. So do get in contact with them if you want to join them. And then you've got a section for membership. So join us. Uh, once you become a member, you get exclusive, exclusive rights to certain uh, aspects of the website and certain material. So you do definitely want to join uh, the Islamic Literature Society. So alhamdulillah, everyone, take advantage of that. Um, so yeah, Doctor, we have come to the end and I would like to thank you very much for your time. And I would, I'm also very grateful in the fact that you are very frank and very upfront with uh, all the answers as well. And I really do appreciate that. So barakallahu fiqh. Jazakumullah for having me. Yeah, no problem, inshallah. And we're looking forward to seeing your next publication and then bringing you back and get to uh, uh, question you or quiz you on that one as well. Inshallah. 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 So on that, Doctor, I'd like to thank you very much once again. And we conclude uh, by giving you a nice, warm salamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Okay, and dear listeners, uh, we'd like to thank you as well for spending with us another amazing uh, discussion with the author. We'll be back uh, next month. You'll see us again. We'll be back with another amazing book, another amazing uh, author. Do leave us your feedback and do join us on the website and do become members of the society as well. Help us um, in growing, in fostering this love for reading and writing. So until next time, everyone, take care of yourselves. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.